Tonight is Mischief Night. The sweetest treat, the intercontinental title. The terrifying trick. Snatch it away from the first ever four-time intercontinental champion, Razor Ramon. Ooh, that's scary stuff. Don't be frightened. It's not the Wicked Witch of the West. It's not even the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. It's the network television debut of Goldust. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Monday Night Raw review. This one is from October 30th, 1995. Not wasting any time here. So there you heard a little of the intro for today's Halloween edition of Monday Night Raw. And we see Vince McMahon dressed up as what he was going to be last year during his trial. Even Jerry Lawler says that he got him that outfit last year, but he never got to wear it. Vince, of course, dressed as a convict. Probably still not out of the woods yet for Vince, but that could actually still be a possibility for him. Our first match is Goldust versus Savio Vega. The debut for Goldust on Monday Night Raw. He beat Marty Jannetty at In Your House. Not really a match to go back to watch besides the fact that it was his debut. It was way too long. Marty had too much offense when it was more done to get Goldust over. Didn't really understand why that was because the longer it went, the less invested the crowd got. And especially since Goldust is a heel, the fact that he won, nobody cared for it. So for this, Goldust worked on Savio's arm for the majority of the match. Vega tries to get a comeback going, but Goldust ducks a spinning kick and then gets the win with a modified rolled up by hooking up the injured arm. So there was a point after all for him working the arm. Still, this match was boring. Never really picked up. This is how they should have debuted Goldust and then had the pay-per-view match, not the other way around. Racer and Owen had to be separated backstage, and then Barry Horowitz and Hakushi continue their debate on whose culture is better. Instead of a match, they decide to use karate fighters, and this was a fair shot, of course, when he isn't being screwed over. Barry Horowitz can't lose here, and he does beat Hakushi here with his karate fighter. All jokes aside, even though I'm still making a joke out of this, when Barry beat Hakushi with these toys, I legit popped as if CM Punk had just returned to wrestling. I've worked myself into a shoot with this one. Like any little thing that Barry Horowitz does, I'm actually like excited for it. Next up, Marty Jannetty still being showcased on Raw. Takes on a jobber. Yeah, he really must have fucked up one too many times, even for Vince's standards. Because when he's on the show, he's been protected and has been given some good wins over the years. Marty can't really blame anyone but himself for never becoming a bigger deal in the WWF. Because even I agree, his wrestling skills would have been enough to keep his career alive for years. Even, you know, even if his mic skills weren't that good. He picks up the win here after a fist from the top rope. Next up, Cornette and his camp come out and mention what happened at In Your House. And they want a return match for the Bulldog against Diesel for the WWF Championship, of course. Because Brett had interfered and cost him the title at the pay-per-view. And his lawyer, Clarence Mason, states that the Bulldog is entitled to a rematch and Gorilla Monsoon is not doing a good job. They bring up something about the contracts that were signed for that match as a reasoning for the needing of a rematch. Jim Cornette also says that it's not right that at Survivor Series, his team is being split up and forced to fight each other. And then they made a mistake by letting Bulldog speak. That's right, Marty Ginetti. You come dancing and prancing back in the World Wrestling Federation. You've got no right stepping in the ring with a British Bulldog. You may rock the World Wrestling Federation. But next week on Monday Night Raw, the British Bulldog will drop you, Marty Ginetti. You don't belong in the same ring, in the same class. In the same style as the British Bulldog, come next week, I'm using you as a stepping hey, stone. Hey, look out, Bulldog, you're going to behind you. Look out, what's he doing? Look out. And out comes Marty, and he attacks the Bulldog and Cornette, and teases Clarence Mason, but lets him go. We're going to see if Davey Boy gets a rematch before Survivor Series, or what happens with this whole situation. You know, even if they are heels, they are pretty much correct because Bret Hart did come out and fuck up that ending to that match, so Bulldog does deserve a rematch at least. Should be a fine match next week though, if they give him enough time between the Bulldog and Marty Jannetty. Next up, we have the Smoking Guns in a match against some enhancement talents. At In Your House, they defended their titles against Razor Ramon and the 1-2-3 Kid. After the match, the Kid attacked the Guns and had to be held back by Razor, and during his match on Raw... The kid basically threatens the guns to give him a rematch and that they better do it soon. The kid grown a pair here. The only thing that I'm kind of worried about is that once he turns heel, his matches aren't going to be as good because they're going to make him work a slower style, I bet. Anyways, the smoking guns here pick up the win against the jobbers. Then, Bret Hart cuts a promo on Diesel 
and it seems like at Survivor Series it will be anything goes because of all the times that they face each other and there hasn't been a decisive winner. I think there might have been like a roll up or two in one of those matches but yeah. That's great news to hear. The match should be a good culmination to their previous sets of matches so I'm looking forward to that. Then we get the Intercontinental title match and our boy is back selling some replica toy championships and some 8x10s of Racer and Diesel. So Racer doesn't waste any time and runs to the ring and attacks Owen. Yokozuna eventually also makes his way down to ringside. These three guys will actually be on the same team at Survivor Series. Owen sends Ramon out of the ring and then Baseball slides him into the barricade. Back in the ring, a spinning leg kick gets Owen a near fall. Then a neck breaker followed by an elbow drop from the top rope also gets a near fall. These Racer Ramon matches have really gotten too predictable. He always ends up in a headlock, then escapes by using a back suplex. Owen falls on top of Racer as he was going for a fallaway slam. Racer eats a clothesline, and then they go to commercial. Coming back, Racer's got him in position for the Racer's edge, but Yokozuna comes in and causes the DQ. Also drops a leg on Razor. The 1-2-3 kid runs out and tries to save him, but he gets a leg drop from Yokozuna as well. And then we see our first look at Ahmed Johnson. He comes out and body slams Yokozuna. The Bulldog runs out, but thinks twice about going after Ahmed, and that's how the show ends. So our first introduction into Ahmed Johnson, already making him a big deal here. Obviously, I've said many times before that anybody now is just taking down Yokozuna, but the fact that on his first night on Raw, making him feel like a huge star already. And then, you know, I feel like I'm being too hard with the grade I'm going to give this, but I feel like I've seen this episode hundreds of times. Debuting Superstar get to win, like Goldust, multiple jobber matches, main event title match ends with a DQ or countout with Racer and Owen, Superstars come out for the save at the end, and that's pretty much it. Sure, that's how wrestling is, but why can't you just let these two guys get 20 minutes to wrestle and just let one of them win? And then after the whole thing, you can have the brawl and people coming out. Getting away from the review for a little bit, and I know that AEW isn't everyone's cup of tea, but I like that they barely ever do a DQ or countout, especially for title matches. Looking through a wrestling promoter's eyes, I don't understand how they can expect to keep viewers and build a loyal audience when they continuously do these type of finishes. So, this show is going to get a bad grade, and WCW does it even more than WWE for stupid matches that you don't even think should be warranting that type of finish. Interferences, countouts, DQs, referee bumps, you name it, WCW and WWF are doing it for whatever reason. I don't like it. And don't get me wrong either, non-finishes can be good every once in a while. Like the match between Diesel and Brett, big man can't lose and a top guy like Brett isn't losing to this new guy yet either. So it has its uses, but not every fucking time that you do a title match on Raw does it have to be a stupid finish. The bad thing is that now I gotta watch out for when I give other episodes good grades when these type of things happen because I'm gonna be called out for switching up and being a hypocrite. To be fair, it's probably how often they do it. If they don't do it for a couple weeks and it's not fresh in my mind, I'll be fine with it. But I feel like they've done this so many times in the last three years of me doing these reviews for Raw. And obviously, the way that I'm reviewing these is like back to back to back. So it's not like I have a week or two to buffer everything. So everything is super fresh in my mind. So if they do a non-finish on one episode and then two episodes later, they do the same thing. It's super fresh in my mind that they just did it. So that's why I'm calling it out. But yeah, I'm going way too long on that. I know I'm going to bring this up eventually on another episode. So for right now, I am out.